Week 17 of the Premiership is in the can and there are still seven teams in contention for end of season honours and that is absolutely wild. Hello amateurs, welcome back to the channel here with you throughout the end of the season and beyond. So hit subscribe down below to make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes. Now, this week of the Premiership, there are no games today on Sunday. I don't know why that was. Does anybody else know? If you know, let me know in the comments. But it seems strange to finish up all this weekend's action on the Saturday. Two games on Friday night, though. Let's go through them in order. Starting with Newcastle, 10th tenth place and without a win all season, versus Bath in third. Bath welcomed back Finn Russell and Cam Redpath to their starting team, so key in their early season form. And they just seem to battle away here up in Newcastle and get early scores. I suggested that Bath would take this win, but Newcastle would put up a big fight. And that was certainly apparent early with some huge tackles on Cock and the Singer and Detroit in particular. However, Thomas Detroit, big Thomas, the try scoring prop, managed to dive over the top of a ruck, which you don't often see successfully end in a try. Um, for the opening score, and then Spencer and Cock and the Singer scored as well. And at 21 0 after less than half an hour, it felt like this was really on the ropes here for Newcastle. Well, they kept on battling and got one back from Jamie Blumeyer uh, from a line out catch and drive, which would prove a strong weapon for them all evening. Matt Gallagher got the bonus point try, though, shortly afterwards with a, just a beautiful gliding outside arc. Uh, really like classical fullback play there from Matty Gallagher. But with the clock in the red at the end of the first half, Jamie Blumar once again got over from a line-out drive. Really crucially, both conversions missed, though, by Newcastle. So 10.28 at the break it still feels like a long way back for them. Second half was a bit of a slugfest. Um, not a huge amount happening until Stewart scored at 63 minutes. Uh, but at 17.28 now, there's still far too much for Newcastle to do. I think... Um, yeah, they show plenty of fight, plenty of grit in this, in this contest, but just the little breaks didn't go their way, just lack of experience maybe in some situations. It's always a tough place to go, and uh, Bath rightfully keep their spot in third as a result of that, and are now heavy favourites for a uh, semi-final. The other game on Friday night, and... Sixth versus eight. This is a real crucial fixture. Sale needed to win with a bonus point to keep their playoff hopes alive. Tigers all but out of it. And I did a full video of this one, actually. I did a full review with lots of details. So I will link that one up there if you want to go and check that out. There's a lot happened in this game. And it was, it was far from a classic. Um, but there was a lot of uh, really important play. And I think one of the key things was Alex Sanderson when he was interviewed midway through the second half and Sale were fairly well comfortably ahead at that point. He was still talking about pragmatism. That is how Sale are going to attempt to win this Premiership title. And if they're not going to open up, you know, when their point's clear at home to Tigers, then they probably won't do it at any stage. Uh, I predicted Sale to continue to get the five points and they did indeed do that. Tigers put up a decent fight. Uh, they really did, but... When it gets down to it, the nitty gritty of actually really challenging and competing hard, that extra little bit of motivation of knowing that you've still got a title to potentially win made the difference in this one as far as I'm concerned. On to Saturday and at Franklin's Gardens, we had Northampton who are in the lead of the Premiership and Gloucester who could not care less. Their selection showed that, their tackling early in the game showed that and they got an absolute pants down spanking at Northampton Saints. Gloucester obviously have got nothing to gain or lose in the league. They've got a Europe uh, Challenge Cup semi-final coming up, but it's an interesting quandary. You know, they want to be, they want to be fresh for that. They want to have everybody fit if they can, but form comes into it too. And if you lose 90-0, that is going to give you some, you know, confidence is going to be kicked there. And this could be hard for Gloucester come, to come back from. They need to switch this round now, change their mindset, probably just park this and let it go before next week's game. Um, otherwise, they might head into that European final, just really lacking confidence. Anyway, what wasn't a question here was Northampton Saints, who were 
absolutely on fire and they scored tries through every, all kinds of different means from consistent phase play through rapid attack they scored driving line out tries in the second half they scored length of the field breakaway tries um, which were quite spectacular Ollie Slight home with a hat trick uh, on the week of the birth of his first child which was a lovely moment Alex Waller driving over, no, actually galloping over from near the 22 on what will be his last home regular season game, I guess, for Northampton. They are guaranteed a home semi-final now, so he will be playing there again. Uh, but that Waller try really encapsulated everything. I can't see which Gloucester player it was, but there was one person left back to make the tackle and he almost ran backwards over the line, just allowing Waller to score. That was a bit embarrassing as far as I'm concerned. And although Northampton were great, you've got to be great to score 90 points in any game. Gloucester were a bit of a joke in this. I predicted a high-scoring thriller. Well, I got the high-scoring part right. It was just that it was all for one team. OK, what was the real big game on Saturday? And this was a proper game. This was two teams really going at it. Proper knockout rugby, essentially. And uh, it, was a, it was a good, tight game. Batley going over it for an early dominant Bristol, but Saracens were forcing errors and they capitalised on them as well when Itoji uh, scored a try. He offloaded inside to Gonzalez and then got the return pass. He really should have been tackled after making that pass. You know, you should just go into him, take him out of the game. You can't allow him to run through the line as easy as he did. These are real kind of defensive basics that Bristol were lacking on this occasion. Uh, so 13 all, 30th minute. Saracens turn over line out. Again, it was a Bristol attacking phase line out that Saracens turned over. And a huge 50-22 from Owen Farrell led to Itoji scoring again. This is absolutely typical of what happened in this game. It was battle, fight, pressure. But then Saracens just had the real key moments of class, which resulted in points. Um, they got another penalty as well before half time and one shortly afterwards. So really building that score. Now 13-26. And what happened next was the opening. It was the chance. It was the big moment for Bristol to get back into this game when Itoji was yellow carded on 50 minutes. Ben Oil was yellow carded less than two minutes later. And Harry Thacker scored a try from a line-out drive to make it 20-26 with eight minutes down uh, with pl uh, playing against 13 to go this was it this is where Bristol should really push on get into the lead at least and then maybe see the game out but Saras Saracens managed to nick another penalty in that time Bristol messed up an, their own line out which allowed an entry for Saracens and some incredible offloading by Saracens obviously we know them as this incredibly uh, pressure based team that can kick and retrieve kicks and tackle and defend but my God, when they want to play, they really can as well. Sagan going over in the corner when they were still down to 14 men. It's a huge blow for Bristol this. 20-34 and just three minutes later, another turnover. Daily break. He looked like he was going to kick and then suddenly realised there was only one chaser coming up and he was certainly quick enough to outpace him. Offloaded it to Sinti, who gassed Genge, passed it on to Gonzalez for the try and at 65 minutes, it was suddenly... 20 points to 41 and game over. Uh, I predicted the Bears to win this one and I think they could have done. They just got the big moments wrong. Saracens got the big moments right and this is huge. They are now qualified for the semi-finals, Saracens, and they are looking strong for a home semi-final as well. Massive win for Saracens this one. Bristol though, they're in, uh, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. They need a lot to go right for them next week. Another huge game, Exeter in 7th versus Quinns in 5th. And this was a brilliant contest for a very long time. An absolute thriller down in Devon. Marcus Smith getting the first try when he squared the defensive lineup by stepping back onto the pass. Dummy inside and clean through a hole around the fullback. But Exeter came straight back with a try by Henry Slade after lots and lots of phase play. Quite a typical Exeter try, really. But then... What happened next was, I think, the key moment in the game when Cade Murley got injured at 22 minutes. Harlequins, rare, a rare occasion here. They'd gone for a 6-2 split on the bench, which meant that Jared Evans came in at 10. It meant that 
Uh, Marcus Smith went to fullback, and it meant that Tyrone Green went onto the wing. So, so many changes. You lose your best fly half at fly half. You lose your best fullback, and possibly the best fullback in the league at the moment, now having to play on the wing. And it just put Quinns off completely, as far as I'm concerned. They never looked the same after that. Um, however, they did get the next try. Tyron Green gliding through the middle after Slade stepped out of the line. But then Smith at fullback made a half break, but a really dodgy offload led to Faye Waboso gliding through to pick the ball up and score. Alex Dombrant then scored a try that looked very, very schoolboy. He got round Fissel out the side of a mall and just bundled over the scrum half like he was barely there. Uh, you don't see tries like that very often. To get a one-on-one in that situation was, was quite uh, impressive. And then, clock in the red, Dan John try. Again, a real typical exit to try with lots and lots of phases, just staying really patient. Fissilau with the mega carry through the middle. Uh, it looked like a big contact with Ernie Herbst, who, um, who sort of, he hit the ground, Herbst. He got the worst of it. Fissilau carried on. Uh, and yeah, Dan John scooting over in the corner after Harvey Skinner's real rapid catch and go. Catch and pass, I should say. So, 21 all at half time. And a thriller. Game on. Three tries apiece. Who knows which way this is going to go. Well, it went only one way. Chiefs really completely dominated the second half. Skinner dashed over to make it 21, 28-21 early in the second half. But then there was a chance for Quinns. There was a big chance when Vermeulen got yellow carded. But Exeter showed a real different side to them. Exeter get penalties, they kick to corners. They tap and go if they're close enough to the line. Not in this game. They collected three penalties uh, over the course of sort of 12 minutes or so to take the score out to 37-21. Henry Slade kicking like an absolute dream uh, in this game, continuing his form throughout the season. And obviously, you know, 37-1 with 21, we all know Quinns could still come back into that. Uh, but Exeter really patiently building the score then and it showed, it absolutely showed. Another key moment happened soon after that when poor Tyrone Green, who'd had another really strong game, got injured. Nobody else to come on from the bench and so he hobbled around for the final 20 minutes. Again, the 6-2 split really hurting Quinns here and Exeter took full advantage. Tyrone Green really was a bit of a... um, a liability in defence now. He couldn't really move. It was very unfair. Fair play to him staying on and seeing out the battle. But three tries from Exeter in the final minutes finished it off. First, Fea Waboso uh, banging through with an incredible finish. Harvey Skinner scooting through a hole and can be no more uh, warranted try than Daft Jenkins, the skipper who works so hard, bundling over in the corner to make it 58-21 and an absolute spanking. I predicted a Quinn's win. I thought they might just have enough. And if those injuries hadn't have happened, who knows? It certainly, I really strongly believe it would have been a lot closer. This could be very damaging for Quinn's. This could be hard for them to come back from now. They've got to win next week and they've got to have other games go for them as well. Exeter, however, now up into fifth and have got every chance of semi-final qualification and who's to say what they can do from there if they get it fair play to Chiefs I thought they showed a huge amount in this game Uh, composure they showed uh, ambition but they also showed that they could build a score it was impressive for me really impressive well done Exeter okay so that's week 17 in the books and this premiership season is going down to the wire and it's thrilling absolutely thrilling Leicester are now officially out Um, Quins and Bears will need a huge amount to go their way for them to qualify and then from fifth upwards you know it's it's anybody's guess really things can change and I'm sure they will change a lot over the over the last weekend okay that's what I think about this week's games but what do you think any players that stood out that I didn't mention any key points in the games that you think will have paid a big factor. Let me know in the comments down below and I'll join you there for a conversation. Give this video a thumbs up while you're down there. If you don't mind, it helps other people find it. And you can subscribe there. You can watch that one next. And do not forget to get out and play.